eternity where there is no time. Nothing can grow, nothing can become, nothing changes. So death created time to grow the things that it would kill. And you are reborn, but into the same life that you've always been born into. I mean, how many times have we had this conversation, detectives? Well, who knows? I mean, you can't remember your lives. You can't change your lives. And that is the terrible and the secret fate of all life. You're trapped. Thanks for that, Rust. As you tap into your inner Nietzsche slash Uspensky and shill about eternal return. Oh, you perennial Manichaean prophet. Nipples for men and birdie num num. But for you who have materialized at the virtual Alexandria, how about a quick definition of Gnosticism? or more like some of its features. Especially since your views on this ancient and perennial way of knowing will change, be expanded regardless of how knowledgeable you think you are. After this electric show on Persian Gnosticism and folklore. Say goodbye to all of this. And hello to oblivion. It's from German scholar Christoph Marxius. 1. The experience of a completely otherworldly, distant supreme god. 2. The introduction of further divine figures conditioned by this experience or by the splitting up of existing figures into figures that are closer to human beings than the remote supreme god. 3. The estimation of the world and matter as evil creation and an experience of the alienation of the Gnostic in the world. 4. The introduction of a distant creator god or assistant. Within the Platonic tradition he is called craftsman, Greek demiurgos and is sometimes described in Gnostic documents as merely ignorant but sometimes also as evil. I am the architect. I created the matrix. I've been waiting for you. Five, the explanation of the state of affairs by a mythological drama in which a divine element, one that falls from its fears into an evil world, slumbers in human beings of one class as a divine spark and can be freed from this state. 6. Knowledge, or gnosis, about this state, which, however, can be gained only through a redeemer figure from the other world who descends from a higher sphere and ascends to it again. 7. The redemption of human beings through the knowledge of, quote, that God, or the spark in them. 8 a tendency towards dualism of different types, which can express itself in the concept of God, in the opposition of spirit and matter, and in the concept of the human being as made of body plus soul. What truth is that? That there is isn't one world, but many, and that we live in the wrong one. This will help them find the door. Again, get ready for new horizons on what you thought the Gnostics were. And welcome to Aeon Gnostic Radio. 
Welcome to the machine, my son, and the means to escape it. Welcome to the desert of the real, here in the inner sanctums of Gnosis, in those outer rectums of reality. Welcome you Johnny Cash Bodhisattvas, you spiritual entrepreneurs, and you veterans of a thousand psychic wars. Time to remember how beautiful you were before they made you forget. I know you're going to do so many wonders. I just know it. I just know it. After all, there is something beyond freedom you're going to experience. The kindling of a divine spark within each one of us that can light the universe and bring meaning in the darkness of mere being. My father says that almost the whole world is asleep. Everybody you know, everybody you see, everybody you talk to. He says that only a few people are awake and they live in a state of constant, total amazement. I am and I am Abraxas, in his meat sack incarnation of Miguel Connor. No longer broadcasting at the lawful and frigid dystopia of Chicago. But these days broadcasting in the Illinois countryside near a town called Wakanda. But it is rather frigid on this November, the year of our demiurge 2018. Thanks for being here, and thanks for being yourself, your true self. No matter what anybody tells you, words and ideas can change the world. We indeed have the infernal pleasure of being joined again by Jason Reza Giorgiani, who materializes at the Virtual Alexandria to discuss his latest book, Novel Folklore. I would say Jason is one of the keenest minds today when it comes to the esoterica, mythology, and comparative religion, as well as a true friend of the Gnostic cause, as doomed as it always is, because peeps just don't want to wake up. Beyond his excellent book that will have your mind expanded and reality disbanded, Jason will grant an extensive discussion on Zoroastrianism and its connection to Gnosticism. Or more like how Gnosticism is simply a natural, vibrant extension of Zoroastrianism. And my apologies to you True Seeker Warriors and Jason for butchering the word Zoroastrianism. As I mentioned in the interview, I was in a week-long conference right before, where I was speaking a lot of Spanish and some Portuguese, so my mind was in different directions. I couldn't even write in English that day of the interview, and I was wondering if I was having a pinche stroke or something like that. Eh, blame it on the Archons, I say when all else fails because they happen to oversee sensible reality and the mazes of the mind. Do you even listen to yourself when you talk? I drift in and out. As I mentioned in the interview, and Jason expands, I've always seen Zoroaster as the first awakened individual, but also as a representation of madness, not the traditional madness or the modern kind. But that lucid awareness when you peer beyond the sublunar realms and are forever and alchemically transformed by the spectrums of the Pleroma. Mundane reality no longer makes sense to you, and you make no sense to the normies around. Even if your words and ideas and art stimulate some of them to fumble for some red pills. It's a Dionysian insanity full of melancholia and longing, the Zinzuch of the Germans. But with a cosmic joy so visceral, you feel you could just melt away from the fabric of reality into a bliss beyond belief. A light that burns twice as bright burns half as long. You've arrived to the unspeakable truth and have purposefully trapped yourself in a world of lies you want to untangle. You are free, but bound to those you want to awaken so much. We are gray. We stand between the candle and the star. 
Maybe you'll hang yourself with a bell tomorrow in the basement. Maybe instead you'll write that perfect poem. Or maybe you'll talk to spirits on a park bench who tell you the cures for diseases. Such as the fine line we walk. That is Zoroaster to me. Madness, craving, yearning for a home you want others to find. I know who I am. After all these years, there's a, there's a victory in that. It might be surprising, but my favorite spiritual passage isn't from the Gnostic text, or the Bible, or Gibrain, or Yeats, or Richard Bach, or whatever. I mentioned Nietzsche earlier, and it's from his Thus Spake Zarathustra. It hits on so many levels and, again, represents that madness of the tragically aware. Oddly enough, this passage kept me alive in many ways after the death of my mother. Flavored often by the music you're hearing right now from the Gnostic-minded Nick Cave. So we end with it, and I hope this is just one of many beginnings of you becoming that ultimate voice in the wilderness, like Zorro, who threw shade at a corrupt world, suffering from fire and fury from angry angels. Here it is. When I came to men, I found them sitting on an old conceit. The conceit that they have long known what is good and evil for man. All talk of virtue seemed an old and weary matter to man, and whoever wanted to sleep well still talked of good and evil before going to sleep. I disturbed this sleepiness when I taught. What is good and evil no one knows yet, unless it be he who creates it. He, however, creates man's goals and gives the earth its meaning and its future. That anything at all is good and evil, that is his creation. And I bade them overthrow their old academic chairs and wherever that old conceit had sat. I bade them laugh at their great masters of virtue and saints and poets and world redeemers. I bade them laugh at their gloomy sages and at whatever had at any time sat on the tree of life like a black scarecrow. I sat down by their great tomb road among cadavers and vultures, and I laughed at all their past and its rotting, decaying glory. My wise longing cried and laughed thus out of me, born in the mountains, verily, a wild wisdom my great broad wing longing and often it swept me away and up and afar in the middle of my laughter and I flew quivering an arrow through sun-drunken delight away to distant futures which no dream had yet seen write your own gospel live your own myth I'm supposed to act like they aren't here. Assuming there's a they at all. It may just be my imagination. Whatever it is that's watching, it's not human. Unlike little dark-eyed Donna, it doesn't ever blink. What does a scanner see? Into the head? Down into the heart? Does it see into me, into us, clearly or darkly? I hope it sees clearly because I can't any longer see into myself. I see only Mark. I hope for everyone's sake the scanners do better. Because if the scanner sees only darkly the way I do, then I'm cursed and cursed again and will only wind up dead this way knowing very little and getting that little fragment wrong too. 
This is the AM Byte interview, and with us we are definitely honored to have back Jason Reza Giorgiani to discuss his new book, Novel Folklore, and uh, a whole bunch of other great heretical sundries. Uh, glad to have you back, Jason, and how you doing? I'm good. It's a pleasure to be with you again, Miguel. Always a pleasure having you, and of course it's always a pleasure to have uh, the moon dog and the Abraxas chicken wingman, Vance. How you doing, Vance? I'm um, great this morning, Miguel. Looking forward to this. Yes, Good definitely. Good to be with you, Vince. Thank you, Jason. Well, awesome. Awesome, awesome. Um, well, I'd like to, before we get into novel folklore and the life of Sadek Hedayat, uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, the Persian culture and Zoroastrian, Zoroastrian is, oh, I mean, I'm butchering that already. I've had too much coffee. The, Zoroastrianism. The, yeah. <laughs> yes, I've been speaking Spanish all week, so now my English and Spanish is wrong because I was at a conference. So these words are getting uh, confusing, but uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about that, Jason, because it's a, it's a good backdrop, not only on novel folklore, but really, it's a great uh, foundation for Gnosticism in general, something that's been overlooked, I feel, and we'd like to address in the show. Why don't we talk with some of the misconceptions and also the legacy of ancient Persia? And uh, basically, I think here in the West, there are misconceptions about the ancient Persians. I mean, I always think uh, when people think in uh, popular culture about the Persians, they might think of Frank Miller's 300 or even some of the caricatures that we see in Tolkien or C.S. Lewis or even uh, uh, the movie Alexander and so forth. And by, and uh, these are basically the sort of uh, dark skin, uh, eyeliner wearing men and they're very centralized. They have a they have an emperor, and without the emperor, they're basically lost. It's a group thing, sort of a Borg culture. And that's sort of the caricature that we have here in the West of ancient Persians. And they're always jealous of the Greeks and the Romans, and they want to destroy them and so forth. But as you have written, that is a complete misconception. In fact, uh, Zoro and the Persians are probably some of the greatest innovators we have in the history of humanity, right? Right. I mean, the reality is almost uh, diametrically opposite to the picture that you are painting there based on the portrayals of the Persians and, you know, popular culture more recently. Albeit, I have to say more recently because, you know, in the uh, 19th century, many uh, great American authors like Emerson, for example, had a very uh, adequate grasp on the reality of the ancient Persian culture. So, you know, we're talking about a culture that far from being um, totalitarian and uh, sort of an, an epitome of oriental despotism was the first uh, civilization where the central concept is um, individuality, human self-determination, free will, uh, to live one's life based on consulting one's own conscience rather than uh, submitting to overlords uh, and their um, revealed code of morality. So Zarathustra is, I would say, the first Gnostic because he's the first person calling for a rebellion against the Archons. He takes the Hindu gods, the Devas, the pantheon of the ancient Aryans in general, including the Iranians, and he inverts it. He demonizes the Devas, which, by the way, is where we get the word devil from. The word uh, devil comes from div the Persian form of Deva. So Zarathustra demonizes the Devas, and he elevates uh, one of the Titans, one of the Ashuras in particular, uh, Ashura or Ahura Mazda, the Lord of Wisdom. And this is basically the Promethean figure of the Iranian branch of the Aryan family. So the other thing that you touched on there in uh, your description of, you know, popular misconceptions of Persian culture is the ethnic question. You know, the ancient Persians were Aryans. They were uh, people very much akin to Europeans in terms of their ethnic uh, characteristics. That having been said, the most defining characteristic of the Persian imperial culture was its cosmopolitanism and its humanism. So although the name Iran itself 
means Aryan. And, uh, you know, the ancient Persians never referred to their realm as the Persian Empire. They called it Aryana Khashatra or the Aryan Imperium. They are also the first uh, historical people who have a conception of sociopolitical order that is based on the cultivation of the human individual, regardless of distinctions between various ethnicities and with a view to creating the optimal conditions for uh, the cultivation and development of the self for all peoples and all cultures. The ancient Persians were the first people to envision a global cosmopolis. And so this archetype uh, of Alexandria or Babylon, um, you could say even in, in uh, reflected in science fiction, Coruscant and Star Wars, the archetype of uh, that cosmopolitan city in which Gnosticism thrives is one that was first instantiated in the Persian Empire. And uh, also, what other ways were they groundbreaking? I think, uh, were they pretty groundbreaking with gender and other issues? The Greeks used to mock the Persians horribly for, you know, how um, strong minded their women were and accuse them basically of being under the thumb of their women. Uh, Persian women played a very significant role as advisors in the royal court. They were commanders at the highest level in the military forces, including, you know, the admiralty of the Persian Navy. And, you know, uh, besides the Persians, we have another branch of the Iranians somewhat more to the north in the Caucasus and around the Black Sea area called the Sarmatians. The Sarmatians are a, a uh, cousin ethnic group to the Persians, another group of Iranians, who are mythologized by the Greeks as the Amazons. So Iranian culture, both in its Sarmatian iteration and in its Persian one, was, was uh, notorious for its, um, for the relatively, well, I don't want to say egalitarian, but the the uh, relatively um, favorable position that women held within uh, Iranian society. I wouldn't say egalitarian because there are ways in which actually Sarmatian culture is matriarchal. Fascinating. And but wasn't Zarathustra pretty divisive? Like, well, like anybody who has gnosis, like anyone who says, "Hey, you can go right to the gods. You don't need intermediaries." Oh, yeah, he was exiled from his home. Yeah. Zarathustra was probably from Azerbaijan. Uh, that's the northwestern um, corner of Iran, going up into the Caucasus along the, along the Caspian Sea. He was probably from that area around Lake Urumye in Azerbaijan. And he was so controversial, he was such a lightning rod that he had to uh, basically go into exile, and he was taken in by a man named Kavi Vishtaspa, prince uh, or lord um, Vishtaspa, later referred to as K. Goshtasp uh, in the Shahnameh and the Persian national epic. And uh, this guy became his royal patron, and it's in the alliance between Zarathustra as a philosopher and Vishtaspa as a king that uh, really the foundation of Iranian civilization is laid as a distinct historical phenomenon branching off of the old Indo-Iranian or primordial Aryan culture. And Jason, I think there's been, you might say, uh, conflict. When exactly was Zarathustra around? There's different dates I always hear thrown around here and there. It's a huge subject of controversy, Miguel. And the best way that I think we ought to uh, conceive of this is in terms of the, the really concrete evidence we have for Zoroastrianism influencing uh, Persian state policy. It's pretty clear that from the time the Achaemenid Empire, the, you know, from the time the dynasty of the Achaemenids founded the first Persian Empire, Zoroastrianism was part of the bedrock of uh, Persian imperial policy. So that means that uh, Zarathustra is is older than the Persian Empire. He's, he predates 500 BC, that much we know for sure. If you look at the language that he composed his hymns in, uh, it seems to be contemporaneous with the oldest form of Sanskrit, with the Sanskrit not of the Upanishads, but of the Rig Veda. And uh, it's, it's sort of a sister language to that and as, as archaic. So that would put it at about 1500 BC. Um, but uh, there's a lot of controversy about that. 
Yes, again, I've heard so many different things. And, of course, the theology is fascinating. And why don't we start tying it in with some of uh, with Gnosticism and some of the other religions. But isn't it true that Zarathustra really thought of uh, that every one of us has a, for lack of better words, a daemon, a divine counterpart? That was pretty uh, innovative. Yes. Um, so regardless of which date you accept for Zarathustra, it's clear that insofar as he is the forerunner of many of these ideas that are central to Gnosticism, he is at least the herald of Gnosticism, if not the first Gnostic himself. And one of these ideas that are so central to later Alexandrian Gnosticism and later Gnosticism in the Persian Empire is the notion that we each have this uh, celestial counterpart or perfected version of ourselves that we are um, evolving toward the actualization of. And uh, this is referred to by Zarathustra as the Dana. And later, uh, this word Dana becomes Din in Middle Persian. And Din turn, uh, tur uh, turns out to be the word for religion. It, it's sort of degraded into the word for religion. In its original sense, it means conscience. So your conscience is your guardian angel and actually the most perfected form of yourself. And in uh, Zarathustra's um, understanding of the fate of the soul following death and in the description of what you could call the bardo state in the uh, Avestan scriptures, there is this idea that after your death, you will encounter your uh, perfected counterpart, your inner conscience in the form of an ethereal maiden. And depending on the state that your soul is in, depending on uh, how faithful you've been to your own conscience, she either appears as like a hag or, you know, filthy whore, or she appears as this uh, you know, youthful, resplendent maiden. And so she is a mirror to the state of your own conscience that you are evolving toward over the course of time. Fascinating. Yes, I, I have always said before that I think uh, Zarathustra is history's first awakened person, but I think history's first Gnostic makes perfect sense to me. And when I was reading novel folklore, I found some great insights, Jason. One of them was basically people in modern times think of the religion of Zarathustra as a sort of this, again, dualistic light versus darkness uh, thing. But as you write in its original principles, the religion was Ahura Mazda and Ahriman were really modes of thought. Uh, the one was negative, one was positive. And it reminded me very much of the Sethians who saw the Aeons as the mind of God, who really was manifested as the, into the mind of humans, and the Archons as sort of our negative thoughts or ideas. So isn't, isn't that a big connection there? And it goes right into the heart of what Zoroastrianus used to be? Yes, I think that, you know, if you're going to have a cosmology based on uh, evolutionary creation, you need an opposed pole. You need a principle of constraint um, and a force of resistance in order for uh, the creative power to be catalyzed into continually transcending itself. And so that dialectical tension is at the heart of Zarathustra's thought, uh, where, you know, Ahriman, um, or Engeramenu in the original of Estin, the, the uh, spirit of constraint, um, is as integral to the force of cosmic creation as uh, Spentaminu, or the progressive mentality, the creative mentality that um, is the uh, quintessential characteristic of Ahura Mazda, the Lord of Wisdom. And so in terms of the archons, um, one of the things that I am concerned to argue in novel folklore is that, and, you know, through this exegesis of Hedayat's novel, The Blind Owl, is that uh, the archons are our own, you know, shadow side. They, we've been alienated from them and they confront us as alien forces 
only because we are not fully psychically integrated. Yeah, fascinating. Again, it really reminded me of sort of the Sethian mythos and the original versions of Zoroastrianism. So, yes, and I pronounce it right. Yes, I'm there. I'm getting that Spanish out of my head. But uh, what about the figure of Sophia? Do we have a figure of Sophia during uh, the different manifestations of Zoroastrianism? Well, one thing to keep in mind is that um, Ahura Mazda is not a male deity. Ahura Mazda is at the very least beyond gender, uh, but uh, you know there, there are six different uh, key characteristics of, of Ahura Mazda, three of which are usually conceived of as male and three of which are usually conceived of as female. These are the Amesha Spentas. They're like archangelic uh, qualities of Ahura Mazda that are um, sort of... Uh, hypostatized as, you know, deities in their own right. And so Aura Mazda is at least equally female as, as uh, it is male. And when you contemplate the fact that this is, you know, the god of wisdom, I think it's fair to see Aura Mazda uh, as divine wisdom, as the divine Sophia. That's uh, one thing. And then the other is, in terms of this spiritual counterpart that is always depicted in feminine terms, regardless of whether it is the inner conscience of a man or of a woman, uh, I would say this is sort of like the microcosmic reflection of uh, the divine wisdom within oneself. So it's like, uh, you know, it's the fallen Sophia within us that uh, we are attempting to reintegrate with uh, the Godhead. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. And uh, for the audience, of course, the Neoplatonists accuse the Sethians of uh, leaning too much or drawing too much on the Orient, a.k.a. the Persians. And this was, I think, uh, Plotinus or Poffrey or one of those cats. And and you have in one of the books, the secret book of John, the lost book of Zoroaster, I think going into your ideas of how uh, Ahriman and Ahura Mazda are modes of thought in the secret book of John, when uh, John is there lamenting the death of Jesus, the Pharisee, his name is Ahriman, and is obviously not a historical figure, but it's probably his own negative thoughts haunting him. So, I mean, it's obvious that the classic Gnostics were very dependent on uh, Zoroastrianism, right? Undoubtedly, I actually think that Gnosticism is inconceivable without Zoroastrianism as a background. Although, Agreed. I have to say, one of my issues with Iranian studies in general and with some of the, you know, um, some of my colleagues who are revivalists of, of ancient Persian culture is that uh, Zoroastrianism, when conceived of as a religion or an ideology, or, or a doctrine comparable to the theologies of other um, faiths uh, is in a way a betrayal of Zarathustra's own teaching. And I think a really strong argument could be made that we ought to instead see Zarathustra as the, as the starting point for Gnosticism and as the first Gnostic. So it's, in that case, it's not you know Zoroastrianism as some codified distinct religion that's a background to Gnosticism. It's Zarathustra who is the progenitor of Gnosticism, which then, you know, uh, becomes uh, more uh, cohesive and distinct as a religious phenomenon in uh, Alexandria and in Babylon during the Second and Third Persian Empires. Yeah, I would agree with you, Jason. I think it's a good argument. But we could also say that other later modes of Zoroastrianism really are the foundation of Judaism, of Egypt, of Greece, of Rome, right? I mean, it's everywhere. It had a profound influence on the entire ancient world, uh, partly because, you know, the Persian Empire was the largest empire in human history in terms of the population that it governed. Um, almost one out of every two individuals on earth were Persian subjects at the zenith of the Persian Empire. Wow, that is big. So moving on into more uh, Gnosticism proper, although we've already talked about the Sethians, really how they were the sons and daughters of uh, Zarathustra. But let's move to Mani. I mean, most people know that Mani was 
Well, he was Persian, although I think, wasn't he raised in an Elkisite home or culture? I mean, uh, what does your studies on Mani tell you? So Mani was not just a, an Iranian, he was of royal blood. He was descended from the Parthian dynasty, uh, and he was raised just outside the capital of uh, Parthian Iran. Now, there were three major Iranian empires um, before the Arab Muslim conquest. The first was the Achaemenids, uh, which is often referred to as the Persian Empire. The second are the Parthians. The Achaemenids were the rivals to the classical Greeks. The Parthians were the rivals to pagan Rome. And they were the other great superpower in the time of pagan Rome, which the Romans were constantly engaged in battle, uh, particularly in Mesopotamia against the Parthians. And then the third were the Sassanids. They were the uh, Persian Empire that was overthrown by the Arab Muslim conquest in 651 AD. So Mani was of Parthian royal blood. He was uh, descended from that uh, second uh, dynasty that ruled Iran. And um, he lived right at the very end of that dynasty and at the beginning of the Sasanian period. There was a lot of religious eclecticism. Uh, throughout ancient Iranian history, but particularly in the Parthian period. And yeah, he uh, came from a family of um, basically Christian Baptists. And so he had a connection to the uh, Judeo-Christian uh, mythos, to, you know, Semitic religious symbolism through his family. And the form of Gnosticism that he develops synthesizes this kind of, you know, Semitic religious symbolism with uh, Zoroastrian ideas. And then ultimately, as he goes on a journey uh, evangelizing in the East, all the way into India, he adopts ideas from Buddhism as well and, and tries to synthesize them into his uh, Gnostic religion. He ultimately develops a conception of Zarathustra, the Gnostic Christ, and Gautama Buddha as the three great world teachers. Yes, indeed. Talking about, uh, as some have said, it really was the first global religion, Manichaeanism. And uh, as you write, which is fascinating, and it sort of reminds me of that Marvel comic. So, you know, what if, what if this had happened? But Mani became very, he, he came under the wing of one of the, the kings of Persia. Why is that? I mean, the Parthian Empire was pretty warlike. Why would they try to bring in this pacifist Gnostic religion under them? Well, so it wasn't the Parthians. Uh, he was descended of, 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 you know, the Parthian royal family. But uh, by the time he started, uh, he started uh, developing his own doctrine, we're seeing the early years of the Sassanid Empire. And um, the second ruler of the Sassanid Empire, a man by the name of Shahpur, is really successful in his military campaigns against Rome on the western frontier of Iran. And uh, his uh, empire is expanding to the point where I think Shahpur got it into his head that he could become the Shah Jahan, that he could become the king of the world and uh, establish a universal state on the earth. And if that's your ambition, it would make sense to institute a religion that's a synthesis of all of the major uh, religions within your realm, namely Christianity in the West, Zoroastrianism in central Iran, and then Buddhism in the East. And so I think one uh, characteristic of uh, Mani's teaching that appealed to Shahpur was its universalism, was this uh, first very conscious attempt to create one world religion. And the other aspect that probably appealed to him was that it was a very pacifistic religion. And, uh, you know, you want a warlike doctrine or ideology while you're still engaged in conquering rival peoples and expanding your territory. But once you have a universal empire to govern, actually, it would make more sense to have a more docile population that is more inwardly focused or more transcendently oriented rather than a people who subscribe to a religion that's, uh, you know, concerned with political power or, you know, uh, bent on um, 
on uh, interference in matters of state. Yes, it would have been a fascinating world if that had moved forward. But as history says, I think the the king passed away and then the next king wasn't so friendly and uh, Mani became a martyr and so forth, even though Manichaeanism thrived for centuries after that. But at the same time, uh, Rome was able to withstand, but Rome uh, was very influenced by Zoroastrianism or the Persians, right? I mean, Mithra was an Eastern god. Yeah, well, the, the story there is a little complicated. Mithra, the, the Mithraic religion predates Zoroastrianism. And probably if we want to look for the um, the context for Zarathustra's own teaching, uh, it is a, a kind of proto-Mithraism. It's the earliest stage of Mithraism. Uh, and then Mithra is adopted into Zoroastrianism as a kind of Christ-like figure, as a uh, sort of intermediary between God and man uh, and a savior figure. Um, and you had two rival forms of Iranian religion, two major rival for forms of Iranian religion before the rise of Manichaeism, one being a more orthodox Zoroastrianism, uh, more monotheistic or, or you could say more dualistic uh, in the sense that the, the emphasis really is on Ahura Mazda um, versus Ahriman, and then another form of uh, Iranian religion where Mithra plays a much larger role, kind of a resurgence of Mithraism. And that form of Iranian religion uh, was the wellspring for Mithraism in the Roman Empire. The um, Parthians waged a psychological warfare campaign against the Romans, sort of, uh, you know, um, as the undercurrent of their explicit military campaigns against Rome. And they were able to deeply infiltrate uh, continental Europe, uh, particularly the Mediterranean coast, with this Mithraic belief system, you know, which obviously has tremendous strategic significance. If you can uh, restructure the religious life of your you know, rival uh, empire, uh, you can ultimately um, defeat them on a, on a psychological mm. level. You know, and uh, have a more enduring victory than anything that could be secured on a battlefield. Yes, and of course, this shows you again. It wasn't Zoroastrianism wasn't monolithic. I mean, there are many versions. I think uh, one that should be mentioned, and it's very overlooked and extremely Gnostic and influenced uh, history a lot, was the following or the movement of Mazdek. Can you tell us a little bit about that, Jason? So this is one of the most astonishing phenomena in the history of Gnosticism. For those of your listeners who, you know, are quite familiar with uh, Alexandrian Gnosticism, and in particular with the school of Carpocrates in Alexandria, you can think of the Mazdakites, the followers of Mazdak, as Persian Carpocratians. They were really... Uh, antinomian, uh, anarchic, libertine Gnostics coming out of Zoroastrianism, claiming that they had the true interpretation of Zarathustra and that they were calling the Sasanian state out on their uh, really uh, conservative, totalitarian perversion of Zarathustra's teachings. So Mazdak is the prime minister of the Sasanian Empire in the 500s AD. And he manages to convince the monarch of the time, Kavad, Shahanshah Kavad, the, the Persian emperor Kavad, to institute a series of radical reforms um, that included uh, socialistic redistribution of wealth, and ultimately, the abolition of uh, you know monogamous marriage and the breaking up of these large feudal harems that had developed by that time, and uh, effectively uses the state power of uh, Sasanian Iran to promulgate a Gnostic revolution across the entire empire. So you know, again, imagine the Carpocratian Gnostics of Alexandria somehow managing to convert a Caesar in Rome 
who then proceeds to use Roman imperial power to affect a Gnostic revolution across continental Europe. I mean, that's that's almost wow. inconceivable. That's it's insane. And that actually happened in Iran. And it didn't happen for a year or two years. This lasted for a generation. It was a 30-year-long Gnostic revolution from the top down in Rome's rival superpower. That's incredible. And isn't there an argument made that the following of Mazdaq also evolved and later on would influence Sufism or other forms of Islam, mystical Islam? It is the origin of, of mystical Islam in general, whether it's Sunni Sufism or whether it's Shia esotericism. Uh, it all is really traceable to Mazdaqism. The Mazdaqites were massacred by uh, the Sasanian conservatives, you know, eventually, I mean, as you can imagine, it's a marvel that these people were able to carry through this revolution for as long as they did. But eventually there was a conservative coup and they were put down brutally by uh, Khosro, uh, the uh, uh, Persian emperor Khosro, who proceeded to massacre hundreds of thousands of Mazdakites by some counts and uh, engage in uh, public book burnings in the capital of uh, Sasanian, Iran, and throughout the empire. So their scriptures were rounded up, and uh, they themselves were executed en masse. But the movement went underground, and particularly in mountainous areas in uh, the north of Iran, in Azerbaijan, and around the Caspian coast. The movement went underground and endured for several centuries, uh, so that you know, when we look at some of the early partisan resistance movements against the uh, Arab Muslim occupation of Iran in the uh, 700s and 800s, we see that uh, these people are occulted Mazdakites, and that's not lost on the heresiarchs uh, of the caliphate who are writing uh, denunciations of them. They all very clearly identify these movements like the Khurram Dinan, those of the joyous religion, Babak. Uh, Khurram Din was the lead, leader of a major partisan movement against the Arabs in Azerbaijan. And the uh, heresiarchs of the caliphate clearly identified the Khurram Dinan as Mazdakites, as a survival of Mazdakism. And there are many other such groups. And the, um, you know, the, the enforcers of, of the orthodoxy of the caliphate are constantly hurling these accusations at these people that they are trying to don the cloak of Islam and uh, preserve their esoteric uh, beliefs in, uh, in an Islamic garb. And so the various uh, forms of Islamic mysticism that are expressed in Persian poetry in the 900s, 10-hundreds, and onwards really uh, arise from out of this Mazdakite or Neo-Mazdakite matrix. Yes, very important to know. And before we really get into your book, again, this is a good foundation for everything we're going to talk about in novel folklore and the work of Hedayat. We also have Zervanism. And to me, it's fascinating because, again, it's so Gnostic. You've got uh, the supreme being who's a hermaphrodite, very much like the, the invisible spirit of the Sethians. And he has two forces that come out of it, uh, Ahriman and Ahura Mazda. But Ahriman ends up taking over the world like the Demiurge. So am I right in that one? Yeah, the interesting thing about uh, the Zorvanite um, conception of uh, the relationship between Ahura Mazda and Ahriman is that um, you have this sense that the primordial deity of time, namely Zorvan, or what the Greeks would call Kronos, or maybe Saturn for the Romans, this deity uh, suffers from a primordial lack, uh, a need, an, a sense of emptiness, and a corresponding desire, uh, which is then uh, hypostatized, it's kind of projected outward and takes embodiment as a an arch demoness called Oz. Oz, they translate that as con concupiscence, like sort of, you know, primordial desire, desire, uh, the root of all desire. 
And this uh, arch demoness causes Zorvan to miscarry in a way where Ahriman is born before Ahura Mazda. And as the firstborn son of the primordial deity, uh, it's Ahriman who becomes the ruler of this earth, the ruler of this world. And Ahura Mazda is, is uh, born only after that. The symbolic significance of, of the order of their, the respective order of their births is that divine consciousness only develops over time. So the fact that there's this primordial desire, which in turn delivers the world over to the devil, is indicative of uh, unconsciousness preceding the gradual rise of the self-consciousness of God. So God has to become conscious throughout the course of time, which is a very Gnostic idea. Very much, yes. Uh, these are all fascinating and, again, give us a good overview of the Gnostic aspects of Zoroastrianism and Zarathustra and how groundbreaking and what a fertile field he left for all these wonderful mystic disciplines. So why don't we get to... Uh, you might say the main event, although everything is equally main, but, and that's your latest book, Novel Folklore on uh, Sedek Hadayat's The Blind Owl. Tell us about this. And in fact, although as you've written and many agree, Hadayat is probably the greatest modern writer, Persian modern writer, perhaps of all times, but you actually have a personal connection to him, right? I do. He was my grandfather's best friend. Tell us a little bit more about his life. Uh, who was he? Where was he born? And uh, uh, what are some of his uh, great works? I guess the, what the Blind Owl would be his greatest work. Yeah, uh, the Blind Owl. I mean, you know, he was a writer very much in the style of Kafka. Wrote a lot of you know novel, shorter stories, stories, and and maybe you could say novellas. You know, very short novels. Um, but he was also a folklorist, and he was quite well known in his time as a folklorist. He was uh, born in Tehran in the early 20th century, and uh, he committed suicide in Paris in the mid-20th century. And, um, you know, with a view to everything that we've already discussed, I, I would say one of the reasons I wrote this book was to do some justice to the complexity of Hedayat's project with respect to the revival of ancient Persian culture. Hedayat in the 1930s went to Bombay, India, to study the uh, Middle Persian language, the language of the Zoroastrian scriptures from the Sasanian period, the epoch right before the Arab Muslim conquest of Iran. And so he's often been interpreted as a neo-Zoroastrian, as someone who was trying to revive, uh, you know, Sasanian period orthodox Zoroastrianism. That's actually very far from the truth. Um, as, you know, we've discussed, there was a lot of diversity in terms of uh, religious belief and cosmology, uh, and even how that's translated into sociopolitics in ancient Iran. There, there was a, a tremendous uh, variety of um, worldviews and uh, multiplicity of understandings of, of the divine, and they were in a kind of dialectical uh, dialogue with one another, which you find in any great civilization. I mean, the same thing was true of Rome. It's not as if you know, I mean, you, there's tremendous religious diversity in the pagan Roman Empire, and even mm -hmm. as Christianity begins to rise, even within Gnosticism, you have so many different schools of, of Alexandrian Gnosticism. Oh, yeah. So this was true of Iran as well. And Hedayat, you know, uh, what he does in The Blind Owl and in various other of his writings, but particularly in The Blind Owl, uh, doesn't conform at all to, to a um, restoration of Orthodox Zoroastrianism. He is uh, most definitely referring to a variety of, of uh, uh, heretical uh, worldviews from um, the Sasanian period and more archaic strata of uh, Iranian cultural history. And I think that he is trying to reach 
back even beyond Zoroastrianism into the most primordial depths of Aryan thought with a view to uh, developing a vision for the future. There are you know, science fictional elements to the blind owl uh, that make it ultimately an archaeofuturistic work, a work that's reaching you know, into the primordial past of Iranian civilization and at the same time uh, with a view toward developing a post-Islamic uh, culture of the future. Yeah, that is true because I look at the work and I'm thinking sort of very dark, magical realism, existentialism. Again, you said he translated the works of Kafka and so forth, but you actually say that if you had one parallel to uh, The Blind Owl, that would be the work of all people, Whitley Strieber. Well, uh, in the sense that it's novel folklore, yes. And the reason I use that title for the book is that you know, in communion, in Whitley Strieber's uh, uh, account of his uh, close encounter experiences, uh, you get a very clear sense that he is descending into the folkloric mind. And the experiences that he has had are of the same type that generated the, you know, folklore of, of fairies and elves and so forth in the medieval European period, for example. And so communion is not just a sort of, I mean, it's got the subtitle, A True Story, but it's not just a biograph biographical account. Um, and on the other hand, it's not simply fiction, although it is being written by someone who authored, you know, fiction. Uh, it, it really is folklore. And the case that I make toward the end of novel folklore is that the blind owl uh, is the first example of the kind of literary work that Strieber produces when he writes Communion. It is a folklore in the form of a novel, but more fundamentally an attempt at creating new folklore, which is, is a profound idea, because folklore structures the subconscious of an entire society. Um, this is an idea that for the first time I tried to develop in Prometheus and Atlas, that uh, the substructure of our world, the logos of, uh, you know, any uh, world historical culture is ultimately folkloric. And even the most basic concepts uh, of the sciences are traceable to folkloric tropes. So what you're doing when you develop new folklore is you're restructuring an entire world. And I think that's the kind of thing going on in communion. And it was most definitely uh, preceded by Hedayat's work. Uh, you know, Hedayat's Blind Owl is probably the first example of that that we can see in literary history. Yes, indeed. Again, he was very groundbreaking. But even then, and you bring this up in novel folklore, it is a fact that Iran in modern times is a hotbed for UFO activity, and it's not something that the government's making up. This is stuff that the CIA and the NSA have looked into. Yeah, I mean, you know, people may laugh at me for saying this, but, you know, elves and fairies are running running rampant in the place. Right, probably uh, for and, thousands of years. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I mean, anyone who really knows Iran knows that, uh, in the, especially in the forests of northern Iran, um, there are all kinds of stories about encounters with uh, what they call genopari, genies and fairies, both both terms from the Persian language. Uh, gen was adopted by the Arabs, and you know it, the the gen become a class of beings in Islamic theology. But this is actually a Persian concept in origin, and uh, pari is a cognate of fairy in Celtic. You know these are Persian and and Celtic are sister languages which evolved from a common root. So, yeah, the uh, folklore of, of uh, genies and fairies uh, goes back as far as uh, Iranian uh, history itself, uh, well, into really the prehistory of Iran. And this is one of the ways in which Hedayat, in The Blind Owl, is reaching back even before Zoroastrianism and trying to reclaim the primordial fairy faith in a way that... Uh, in a way that is also science fictional and that marks a, a sort of aesthetic 
stylistic transition between fairy faith folklore and science fiction uh, involving, you know, alien beings or celestial entities and so forth. It's right on that, uh, you know, liminal boundary between these two aesthetic uh, styles, these two types of literature. And again, in that way, it's the herald of a work like Whitley Strieber's Communion. Yes, indeed. And before we get into the plot, and again, you mentioned this in your book and uh, other people have mentioned it, isn't there some sort of a, a story within the story or story on top of the story that if you read The Blind Owl, you will commit suicide? Sort of maybe like the curse of, uh, I think we were talking about it, the curse of uh, at the end of uh, Philip K. Dick's uh, 13 Principles of Christian Gnosticism or the Book of Revelation or the secret book of John where there's like a curse at the end, you will die. Yeah, I mean, this is not something Hedayat did himself, but, you know, the man committed suicide uh, in Paris in, um, you know, 1951. And so I think uh, partly on account of that, this superstition has arisen that uh, if you read The Blind Owl with any care, uh, you will wind up committing suicide. And, you know, there were a few instances of this of people who were suicides, who had read The Blind Owl and were obsessed with it. But of course, it's a chicken and the egg kind of thing. I mean, what kind of person gets obsessed with The Blind Owl in the first place, right? <laughs> so, yeah. you know, but uh, Persians are rather superstitious people. And this has become a widely promulgated uh, superstition in Iran, which is ironic because at the same time, the novel is recognized as the greatest literary work in the Persian language. So, I mean, w w what's going on there? How can it be, you know, <laughs> yes. the greatest literary work if no one's reading it? Yeah, it's like people killing themselves after Harry Potter or something here in the West. <laughs> and uh, is this novel available in Iran? It hasn't been banned or anything else with all the changes? No, it's available. It is still available in Iran. Um, interestingly, Hedayat had it banned uh, when he wrote it. Uh, he um, he drew the first cartoon of Muhammad. You know, these, these people recently who uh, you uh -huh. know, are being shot left and right in Europe for drawing cartoons of the Prophet Muhammad. Well, the first uh, person in the modern period to have uh, drawn a cartoon of Muhammad for the fronts piece of one of his friend's books was Hedayat. He used to do sketches. And so he did this cartoon of Muhammad, and he got really severely reprimanded by the Iranian censors for having done this in the 1930s, even though, uh, you know, Reza Shah's uh, regime in the 1930s, early Pahlavi Iran, was a very secular state. Um, he was still severely reprimanded, and he was so pissed off at the ingratitude of the Iranian censors, despite his major contributions to Persian literature, that when he uh, wrote The Blind Owl in Bombay, while he was there, you know, studying Zoroastrianism, he put this notice on the inside, the sale and distribution of this work in Iran is prohibited. And he did that <laughs> to punish the Iranian people. Well, he had a temperament. So uh, why don't we talk a little bit about the basic plot of The Blind Owl? I guess, why don't we talk first the, the symbolism? What exactly does the owl represent in uh, Persian lore? The owl is the one bird too many created by Ahura Mazda. Uh, it, um, it has a kind of ominous uh, significance, um, say, sort of ill-omened uh, creature that is associated with the preternatural, with a kind of ungodly supernatural, you know, sort of the sense of the twilight zone. Right. And, um, you know, there is this uh, famous legend of the, the conference of the birds where you have these birds who go on a journey to find God. And, you know, many of them are, are killed along the way and others lose their way. And in the end, you know, 30 birds make it into the presence of God. And these 30 birds, these Seymour, come to recognize that all together, they are sort of various plumes of uh, the divine bird th themselves. The Seymour, the 30 birds, are the Seymour. The Seymour is a mythical divine bird. And so, you know, this is a kind of Gnostic um, uh, myth uh, that has to do in a way with the idea of syzygies, with the idea of us being fragmented uh, parts of uh, larger psychical 
um, holes, you know, and that we can reintegrate with each other in order to uh, to reunify with our divine counterparts. The most developed form of this myth is in Fariduddin Attar's Conference of the Birds uh, from the uh, 1100s in Iran. And in that story, the owl refuses to undertake the, uh, the journey with the other birds. He kind of you know, is really cynical and nihilistic and uh, thinks that um, the other birds are sort of you know, deluded and on a fool's errand. So <laughs> that's in the back of Hedayat's mind when he is uh, developing this imagery in the novel of the owl as the shadow of the narrator. We have this unnamed narrator who is putting pen to paper to make himself better known to his own shadow. Uh, and this shadow of his that stretched across the wall of his room is uh, that of an owl. Fascinating. And I believe there is one part, and this is sort of the central theology of the book, but also in many ways Zoroastrianism in itself and more primordial forms, as uh, I think, and I'm quoting you, and I think it's the owl who says it, but he says that, he doesn't want to pursue God, but wants to live in the ruins of the world where there is treasure. What is that, Jason? I think that, um, you know, ultimately, one of the messages Hedayat is trying to get across in this novel is that uh, our ethereal conception of the divine, our conception of the divine as totally transcendent of this world is a false ideal um, and that you know there is no ultimate distinction between the supernatural and the natural uh, we live in a, in a, a preternatural reality we live in a twilight zone uh, where the impossible can happen but um, it is just as often the accursed as it is the miraculous so you know, this sense that you find in um, 20th century occult literature and, let's say, Lovecraft of uh, the supernatural that is ungodly um, because it is it is simply the ungraspable aspect of, of nature itself. Uh, you see that most definitely in, in Hedayat's novel. And that's the skepticism of the owl who recognizes uh, the bewitched and recognizes that uh, the inconceivable can take place, but that this is not indicative of any divinely transcendent dimension of reality that would have a positive moral valuation. Well said, and it certainly reminds me a little bit about Philip K. Diggs' God in the Gutter when I was reading that part. So. That's exactly it, exactly. Good. I got. See, yeah, we're thinking a lie. Awesome. <laughs> see, the central figure in this novel is a, a uh, an ethereal maiden or a celestial woman who uh, shows up to the door of the uh, the unnamed narrator's home and basically comes in and dies on his bed. And um, her physical characteristics are very much reminiscent of these uh, hybrid beings that are discussed in close encounter literature, you know, with the large almond shaped eyes, right. uh, but with hair, not like the grays, you know, like with hair and, you know, like a pointy chin and, and so forth and very uh, sort of um, elongated limbs. And so this, this uh, sort of changeling hybrid uh, being shows up and surrenders her body to him and, and dies on his bed. And, uh, the novel is, is ultimately about his relationship with this woman across multiple lifetimes and different dimensions. But in that present time frame, in the uh, frame narrative of the novel, he winds up uh, chopping up her corpse and uh, dumping it in a, in a makeshift grave. So it really is the god in the gutter because she is the fallen Sophia. She is, uh, you know, the divine within himself. She's his Dana, his inner conscience, his Dean, in a way, his religion. And yet she winds up, her spectral body winds up being uh, chopped up and dumped in a ditch. So it really is the sense of the God in the gutter that we find uh, at the core of this novel. 
to end, Jason, maybe tell the audience uh, where they can find more about your work and um, what are you working on anything else new? Yeah, I'm working on a one volume study of the Iranian civilization right now, uh, which hopefully uh, will be finished in the very near future. Um, but where uh, people can find my work is on my website. Uh, it's Jason Reza Giorgiani. Um, Reza is R E Z A, Jason Reza Giorgiani.com. And there's links there, not just to my various books, but also to the whole archive of my interviews and uh, you know shows that I've done. Wonderful. Well, I certainly advise the audience to go there and check out his books, Prometheus and Atlas, Novel Folklore, Lovers of Sophia. It's just a treasure trove of the esoteric and the reality behind this history that we've been presented by the Archons and their slaves. So, But we've come to the end. Vance, thanks for uh, joining us. Oh, it's my pleasure and uh, very educational. A lot, a lot of things uh, that are new to me, so I'm going to be pondering all that. Jason, it's been a pleasure. Been a pleasure, Vance. Thank you so much, Miguel. It was great to talk to you both again. And there you have it, my beloved true seekers. The first part of our interview with Jason. I hope you're as impressed as I am about Persian Gnosticism and all Gnosticism. And the ideas stay just as enlightening in our second part. In our second part, we continue exploring the blind owl. This includes understanding much of its symbolism, including the serpent in Persian lore. Jason brings in the ideas of Henry Corbin and the imaginal to the themes of the blind owl. We really get our hands dirty in understanding the Archons and their relation to aliens. And that means looping back to the work of Whitley Strieber. We also focus on Jason's other book, Lovers of Sophia, where he explains the notions of free will and predestination. And then Jason grants a mind-blowing definition of God that would make Philip K. Dick and Carl Jung and really any mystic excited. Somewhere too, we bring in the trial by Franz Kafka and its true meaning. And much more. So check it out by becoming a member or patron at Patreon. All means found at the God above God debt can you get some cool benefits beyond just getting full shows i say i say and in the end it keeps this red pill cafeteria open i can't do it without you and this venture is 99.99 percent audience supported i make some dough from youtube ads but that platform has been squeezing me hard lately even demonetizing my first channel so please help. I hope you like this, and like all other shows, it has expanded your mind while disbanded false reality. I hope you're closer to connecting with your inner Zoroaster, found that madness and awareness to write your own gospel and live your own myth. Rage against heaven and storm the gates of hell for your misplaced childhoods and paradises lost. That's all I got. Thanks for being here. Thanks for being your true self. Hello and goodbye as always. <laughs> <laughs>